respect to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voice of the trumpet and the three angels which are yet to sound. Amen. Now, if you are listening to some of these things as we are reading, you will realize that some of them sound like what the Egyptians experienced in the time of Moses, where the sea turned into blood and uh, all those things. So hopefully you guys have been reading these chapters ahead of me. Uh, it helps to do homework, read these chapters ahead of time so that when we then go into it, we are not strangers to what we are talking about. Amen. So now here, last week, we're looking at how the calamities of the world would change. They would change from being natural calamities to a point where they become supernatural calamities. This is where God is now uh -huh. coming in and beginning to bring judgment. But you know, now the Bible says here, Hallelujah. The Bible then says that at the sound of one of the trumpets here, you saw that you had a change where the seventh seal is executed. So the situation sounds terrible now when you read it, where you have a third part of the earth, you know, uh, burning up and the third part of the sea becoming blood. Uh, that, that is verse 8 of chapter 8, I think. And the sounding of a third trumpet, you get a great star which falls upon the third part of the rivers and upon the springs of waters. And the third part of the waters will become wormwood. And at the sounding of the fourth trumpet, the third part of the sun and the third part of the moon and the third part of the stars will be smitten or strike, stricken so that the third part of them will be darkened. So here you see this is the coming in of the judgment of God. These are things that God created when you go to Genesis. They were created to support life on earth. They were created to support humanity or to support man as man lived. The sun, the stars, the moon, the waters, the rivers, everything. They were created by God for the sustenance of life. But here now in Revelation, we now see judgment coming upon the very things that at one stage were meant to sustain life. Because of the way man has lived life, the way man has rejected God, the way man has provoked the anger of God, the judgment of God would begin to come. And it would start with the very elements that were touched before man was made. You remember when you look at the creation, all these things that we've mentioned were created before man was created. And now, before judgment falls on man, it also begins on those very elements that were there before man. So this would serve as a warning to mankind to sense that something is not right. Something has to change, something has to give. Because if man came on earth after he was created on the sixth day and he found the sun there and the moon and the stars and the trees and the rivers and everything that was there and it sustained his life, the moment those things begin to die and they begin to be turned off as it were by God, it would serve as a warning to mankind that there is something that is happening now. The problem is, like Jesus would say at one stage in the uh, Gospels, that you are able to predict a lot of things, and yet you fail to predict the times or the seasons of God's move on earth. So right now we see a lot of things that are happening. We, we see a lot of wrestling going on uh, in Europe. We see what's happening with America. We see what's happening with North Korea and Britain and everything. And a lot of Christians do not know how to interpret that according to the word of God. Now, when you read in the book of Daniel and you read again in the book of Revelation, you realize that Britain or the United Kingdom coming out of Europe is something that was mentioned in the Bible years ago that it would happen. And even the fact that the UK will go back into Europe, again, it's in the word of God. 
So what is happening is you are experiencing the shiftings of power, where power will shift even from the US. There are things that America will have to go through that will weaken it. And the power then shifts into Europe and the Asia bloc. Again, it's in the word of God. These are events that are to happen. We'll touch them later on, don't worry. But these are events that are meant to herald the coming, not only in the revelation of the Antichrist, but also the coming of the day of the Lord. So as Christians, we've got to be able to look at the things that are happening around us um, through the eyes of the Spirit. When you realize the Bible speaks about the coming of the Lord that as it was in the days of Noah and as it was in the days of Lot, um, the time will be ripe for the coming of the Son of Man. Now, what happened in the time of Lot? Notice the time of Lot is mentioned after the time of Noah. The time of Noah was a time of uh, drunkards and marriages and so on. But when you go into the time of Lot, you realize that in the days of Lot, marriage is not mentioned in the days of Lot. Because in the days of Lot, the one thing that was prominent, there was homosexuality. And so you find that we are now in a period where marriages are suffering. Marriages are breaking up left, right, and center. And the one thing that is, seems to be prominent is the homosexual movement. So you find that we are in the days of Lot, according to the seasons of the Bible, everything is happening in readiness to the coming of the Lord. So we were looking at the seven trumpets last week, and we were saying we are living in the, or the seven seals, we are living in the period of the first four seals right now. The last three seals have not yet been opened. And those seals come with trumpets, and each trumpet will herald a coming of God's judgment and of a move of God. So these things will not happen or come into being by accident. These are things that are ordained of God. There are certain things that are happening in this lifetime now that are not happening by accident. They are happening because they are ordained of God. They are happening according to their seasons in God's time and in God's move. So you will find that in Matthew chapter 24, verse 6, the Lord Jesus prophesied about two kinds of war that would come. Wars of people against people and nations against nations. So when you look at the people against people, that's civil war. And nations against nations, that's international wars. So you realize that from the time that the Lord ascended, there's been loads of civil wars, there's been loads of international wars. Already the fulfillment of the word of God had begun. So we are also living, every day of our lives is a living out of the prophecies of the word of God. Whether we live them out negatively or we live them out positively, but we are living out that which was prophesied a long time ago. And the Lord also in Matthew 24, he also predicted in verse 7 that there would be earthquakes in various places. If you do your research, you will find that each year they, they say there has been approximately five to 6,000 earthquakes that have ranged from two to eight on the Richter scale. Now, these earthquakes are fulfillment of the prophecies of the Lord. We wake up and we hear on the news, there's been an earthquake in such and such a place, or there was an earthquake last night in such and such a place, and people you know, are buried in rubble and they're trying to find them and the rescuers are at work and stuff. What we then focus is on what the rescuers are doing, trying to rescue these people. We forget to remember that these earthquakes are actually fulfilling the prophecies of the Lord Jesus and the words that he spoke. So you realize that the, in the will of God, there are things that are to be fulfilled and those things are to be fulfilled by us as well as by himself and the angels that are at work. They are to fulfill the purposes of God and the will of God. Now, 
The Bible is showing us here that God will warn people again and again with wars, with earthquakes, until the time of the fifth seal, when the martyred souls begin to cry after they no longer can tolerate the situation. We read that in chapter 6 last week. So the martyred saints begin to cry and say, how long, O sovereign God? How long will you not judge our blood and those who dwell on the earth? That is chapter 6, verse 10. And you also get to seeing it in Habakkuk as our brother had put there. Now God's answer would then come in the sixth seal when the earth will be shaken and the heavenly hosts will be smitten. That's the one that we read there where the, the, the hosts of the heavens, when you talk about the hosts of the heavens, you're talking about the sun, the moon, the stars, where they will be stricken. Uh, that becomes an introduction and warning of the coming tribulation. The sixth seal and the first five trumpets, you will realize that they are related. You're going to see that there are trumpets that blow in relation to a seal that is opened. So you have trumpets that are associated to a particular seal. When a seal is opened, certain trumpets are blown. So there are seals that are attached to trumpets. So you have seven seals and you have seven trumpets. The number seven, you remember, we're talking about the seven horns, the seven eyes of the spirit. So it's talking about the intensification of things in the time. So everything will start happening at such an intensified level. This is why the Christians of today must no longer move in double portions of the anointing. You can no longer afford to move in a double portion. I know we sing about double, double. But according to the book of Revelation, you need to move in the sevenfold level of the anointing. No longer the twofold, but sevenfold. Because everything around you is becoming intensified. And so the anointing on your life must also become intensified. It must no longer be a twofold anointing. It must be a sevenfold. Seven being the number of completion according to God's move. So you must have the anointing that is complete at seven different levels to match these things that are happening in our days because the enemy is going to throw everything that he has against us, against Christianity, against humanity. And it's going to be so intense. That's why the Christians also need the anointing that is intensified. We need to understand God at a, at a higher level. We need to have the revelation of God at a higher level. We need to have the spirit of the fear of the Lord at a higher level. We need to have the spirit of understanding at a higher level, the spirit of might at a higher level. So the seven spirits of God have to manifest in our lives. In whatever situation we go, we must operate at those seven levels. There must be wisdom in how you deal with situations. There must be understanding in how you perceive circumstances and situations. There must be power. There must be might. There must be revelation in every circumstance of your life, whether it's at work, it's at home, in your marriage, concerning your children, uh, whatever projects you may set out to do, you must always go into those situations with this sevenfold anointing upon your life. Uh, without that, you will find that you will struggle and you will wonder what is going on. But as long as you have the sevenfold uh, anointing, or you will be at peace, even at times when, when the enemy seeks to destroy. That's why you find Jesus, whenever he faced all sorts of temptations and all sorts of challenges, you would be at peace. You would not panic like we do. You would wake up in the middle of a storm and you would not panic. He would speak to the sea and command it to be calm. In other words, God wants to bring us to that level where we have the sevenfold anointing, where even in the midst of a storm, we can still have our peace. We do not break apart. Yeah, Christians should not break apart uh, when faced with storms, when faced with challenges. Christians should not fall apart. We should be able to hold everything together. But that can only happen 
when we are moving in the level or the seven levels of the anointing. We spoke about those seven levels, even right at the start when we looked at Naaman being told to dip himself seven times into the Jordan. We were saying the skin, the human skin is made up of seven layers. So that means the, each time he was dipping in there, there was a layer of his skin that was being healed. So by the time he went in the seventh time, all seven layers had been healed. So his healing was complete. So we must be a, 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 a people um, that move with the sevenfold anointing. That means that every layer of life, you are anointed for it. Mm. Whether it's at work, it's at home, it's in your marriage, mm. it's with your children, whatever situation, you are anointed for it. So you shouldn't panic and you shouldn't fall apart. Amen. If everyone Amen. could just mute the, uh, the uh, if you can just put your systems on you on mute guys your phones your your whatever devices you are using can you just mute thank you so when we come here we, if you look in the book of Joel again Joel chapter two says that certain things will occur before the day of the Lord if you read in the New Testament prophecy along with Old Testament prophecies. You will see that there is a time called the day of the Lord. This is the great tribulation. The day of the Lord means the day of God's wrath or the day of God's anger. The day of his coming in to interfere with the world by means of supernatural calamities. The day of the Lord will be terrible. Even as we are reading there, you can see it's frightening stuff. Several prophets of the Old Testament mention the day of the Lord, and they will indicate that it will be a dreadful day. Joel chapter number one, verse 15. Joel chapter two, verse one. Verse 11, verse 31. Zechariah chapter 14, verse one. Malachi chapter four, verse five. So the sixth seal will be before the day of the Lord meaning that it will be before the great tribulation. The great tribulation will begin at the sounding of the fifth trumpet. The first four trumpets, they're like the preliminary to the great tribulation. It's like when you start your car, you turn the ignition on, then the motor starts, then the car runs. The car just doesn't start by running. No, you turn on the ignition, the car starts. So that turning on of the ignition is the start to the move of the car. So this trumpet is like, like the ignition. It is what is turning on the tribulation. So it is what it introduces the coming of the tribulation. Now, when you Turn your car on. If there are any people that are around the car, just that turning on of your car is a warning that the car is about to move. So people get out of the way. Is that not right? Now, this trumpet also is like that. It is a warning. It is to serve as a warning of the move that is coming. The day of the Lord, the wrath of God or the judgment of God. So, if you turn your car on, it doesn't mean the car is started moving. No, just turning it on to say it's getting ready to move. Similarly, this trumpet here is what prepares people for the great tribulation. It's just the sound that says, get ready. Now, these trumpets will cause suffering or they will bring suffering. There's a damage to the earth a damage to the water, a damage to the heavenly hosts, like we read, it will be greater than the damage that is caused by the earthquakes of the sixth seal. So from the time of the sixth seal, there will be nothing good for men on earth. Nothing. The New Testament indicates that the early overcomers or the believers in the Lord first and what are known as the first fruits will be taken away from the earth shortly before the sixth seal. 
according to Revelation and Matthew and other portions of the word, we can safely say that the first kind of rapture, because there are several raptures here, so you get this rapture of the first fruits, where the early saints, those who died in the Lord, will take place. They will be raptured or they will be taken up. So when you recall the promise of Christ to the church of Philadelphia, I think in Revelation chapter 3, verse 10, when we started this book, you remember he told them that he would keep them out of trial, which would come upon the inhabitant of the earth or the inhabited earth. He is saying he will take them up before this tribulation comes. So those who love the Lord and those who seek after the Lord will be taken away before the sixth seal is open. So immediately after the opening of the sixth seal, we then have chapter seven, which we read now. Chapter seven is put in there before the great tribulation. The natural events of things should have been from chapter six, you go to chapter eight, when you look at the happening of things. But there is a break in between, which is chapter seven. The break in between there is very significant. It is put in there before the great tribulation. It's to show that before the great tribulation, there are two things that the Lord will do. He will seal the chosen remnant of Israel and he will rapture the redeemed ones of the church or the Christians. We read there that he will begin to number Israel. We heard about the 144,000 that will be numbered in verse 1. But in verse one, no, verse one, he says he saw four angels standing upon four corners of the earth, holding fast the four wings of the earth, that no wind should blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. Now, one of the things that you realize is that the devil has learned a lot from God. You will find that he tries to duplicate the way things, the way God does things. Whenever the devil wants to destroy things in your life or wants to destroy you, he raises up winds and storms that come against you. There are winds that come against your marriages. There are winds that come against your finances, winds that come against. But here what you see is that there are angels that are raised by God that have the capacity to hold back the winds from destroying your life or from, being dis from bringing destruction even to your marriages, to your finances and everything. There is this ability that has been given to angels to hold back the winds. So anytime you sense yourself going through winds and, and, and storms and winds coming against you that are contrary, you need to call upon the Lord and ask him to raise those angels that will hold back the winds and prevent the destruction. So here now, we see this event happening between the sixth and the seventh seal. The seventh seal is in chapter eight, and the sixth seal is in chapter six. But now you see this event in between where the angels are being told to hold back. What that shows you is that God cares for his people, even when he's about to execute judgment upon the earth. He is still holding back the winds. He is still holding back them from the four corners of the earth that they do not bring destruction. Hey, God is a caring God. He cares for us and he loves us so very much. The winds are here for God's judgment. You should read Jonah chapter number one, verse four. You will realize the story of Jonah where the wind arose to judge Jonah's situation. That wind was coming from God. Isaiah chapter number 11, verse 15. Jeremiah chapter 22, verse 22. Jeremiah chapter 49, verse 36. Jeremiah chapter 51, verse one. So now the next verse says, and I saw another angel ascend from the rising of the sun having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to harm the earth and the sea. 
So here you will see that this other angel, like we said earlier on, is in reference to Christ. You will see that in chapter 8, verse 3 of Revelation, chapter 10, verse 1, chapter 18, verse 1. And in the Old Testament, Christ, like we said, was also called the angel of the Lord, who was God himself. Genesis chapter 22, verse 11 to 12. Exodus chapter number 3, verses 2 to 6. Judges chapter number 6, verses 11 to 24. Zechariah chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. Zechariah chapter 2, verse 8 to 11. Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1 to 7. So you see that Christ is called the angel, the angel, not an angel, but the, that makes it, that makes him a specific angel that is being referenced to the moment where you put the before the angel. So now, according to the prophecy and Israel's present situation, they have returned to the land of their fathers, but in unbelief. They hold on to their old religion and they do not believe in God according to his New Testament move. They are in rebellion to God's purposes and will because they hold on to the old and they hold on to their religion. When Jesus came as Lord, he changed the dispensation of God from the keeping of the law to that of believing in the Lord Jesus. But Israel still believes in keeping the law rather than believing in the Lord Jesus. So the Jews would not accept this and they are very stubborn about it and very disobedient to God in that regard. And God has tolerated that for centuries. And he has returned to restore them again and again and again, but they are still in unbelief. They still do not believe uh, in the Lord Jesus. So now here, you realize that according to the word of God, Israel will remain in unbelief until the last day. <laughs> then this is where God comes in. And he will take care of them though, not for their sake, but for the sake of his kingdom. He knows among the unbelieving Jews that there are some who are faithful. And before he will actually judge the earth with supernatural calamities, he will seal them. That's what we read in chapter seven. So the first trumpet is to harm the earth and the trees, according to chapter eight, verse seven. The second trumpet is to harm the sea, chapter eight, verses eight to nine. The third trumpet is to harm the rivers. The fourth trumpet to harm the heavenly hosts. But before the executing of the first four trumpets, God will seal his chosen Israelites or Jews to preserve them from the supernatural calamities. So we, in the first four trumpets, or the first four trumpets will harm only the earth, the sea, and the rivers, and the heavenly hosts. Those are the only things that will be harmed. The heavenly hosts are the sun, the moon, the stars. It is the fifth trumpet that will bring torment to men directly. The first four trumpets are not touching men directly. They are touching the rivers, the earth, the sea, and the heavenly hosts. But the fifth trumpet is what will bring torment to men directly. So God's sealing of his chosen is a special way of preserving them from the torment of the fifth trumpet, which you will read in chapter 9, verse 4. Now, in chapter 7, verses 4 to 8, we see that God will seal 144,000 out of every tribe of the sons of Israel, sealing 12,000 out of each of the 12 tribes. These are the Israelites who will keep the commandments of God during the tribulation. That is in chapter 12, verse 4, 17, chapter 14, verse 12. We'll see that as we go. Now, although 144,000 Israelites will be sealed on their foreheads, the Bible does not tell us what kind of a seal it will be, but it will be a mark that is recognized by angels who come to judge the earth. The angels will recognize that mark. Remember like in, in, in Exodus, 
where the angel of death would come to bring judgment, but he would recognize the blood that was on the doors, and the, that way he would spare every place that had um, blood on it. In the same way, if amongst the children of Israel there were others who had not put blood on their doors, they would have been destroyed. And similarly in this time, the ones who will not have the mark will go through the tribulation. They will go through that judgment. Now, in verses 6 and 8, we see that Joseph has a double portion in this ceiling. According to 1 Chronicles chapter 5, verses 1 to 2, and Ezekiel chapter 48, verses 4 to 5, you realize that Manasseh, one of the two sons of Joseph, according to Genesis chapter 48, verse 5, stand for two tribes. So you have Manasseh coming in there. And you have Joseph, who has the double portion of the birthright. Reuben was the firstborn of Israel, we know that. But because of his sinfulness, he lost his birthright. And Judah prevailed above his brothers. That's why you find Judah is mentioned first. When we read the verse 5 of chapter 7, it starts with the tribe of Judah because Judah prevailed. So it starts with Judah. When you, can I give you a bit of homework, guys? Go back into your Old Testament. Read about the 12 sons of Israel. When Israel or Jacob is blessing his children and cursing them. You realize that there were two that were displaced from the 12. They were replaced by Manasseh and Ephraim. So you realize that when the priest went into the tabernacle of God to pray, on his shoulders, he carried the 12 names of the 12 sons of Jacob or the 12 names of the 12 tribes of Israel. But in the breastplate, he also had names that had two who were on the shoulders who are no longer there, replaced by Manasseh and Ephraim. I want you to see this. On the shoulders, he carried them all. But the best breastplate, which is closest to the heart, there were others that were carried on the shoulders who were not there close to his heart. You want to get this. As Christians, we are all carried on the shoulders of the Lord, but not all of us are closest to his heart. What brings us closest to his heart is how we live our lives, how we conduct ourselves, and how much of ourselves we give to him. It's like the 12 disciples. He had 12, but many times there were three that he tended to do the most with. So if you do not seek God in the manner that you should seek him, do not then become jealousy when you are not included among the first three, when you are left in the, in the last nine. Eh? You remember when he took the disciples up the mount, he took Peter, James, John. The others never went there. So they did not see what these ones were seeing. This is why sometimes we, we wonder, we look at certain people that are used by God and we wonder, how? How is he using them like that? When the Bible says God is no respecter of persons, how come he's using them so much and he's not using us? Aha, uh -huh, check your position. You could be just on the shoulders and not be. <laughs> uh, Lord, help us. Lord, help us. Amen, my sister. May we be closest to the heart of Jesus. Again, can I show you something before I go further? Jesus spoke to his disciples, the book of John. And he says, one of you here is going to betray me. And the Bible says, they all began to ask and say, is it I? If you read that narration of the scripture, there was one disciple who did not ask that. The Bible speaks about John who lay on the bosom of the master. The Bible actually says the other disciples were asking him to ask the Lord who he meant. <laughs> I like that. So instead of them just asking the Lord, they were asking this disciple to find out from the Lord for them. 
Do you know why? Because this guy, while they were all sitting around Jesus, this guy has his head in the bosom of Christ. As he had his head on his chest, I believe he could even feel the heartbeat of Christ. We are living in a time where God is looking for a people who can feel the heartbeat of God, people who understand what it is that gets the heart of God going. Those are the ones that people will consult for solutions to life's issues. Anyway, I'm, I'm digressing there. Dan, according to Revelation chapter 7, is omitted. Dan is one of the 12 sons of Israel. But here you see Dan has been omitted to those who are being marked here in Revelation. So again, in First Chronicles chapter 2 through 9, the tribe of Dan is omitted because of their idolatry. Again, you can see that in Judges chapter 18, verses 30 to 31. First Kings chapter 12, verses 29 to 30. Second Kings chapter 10, verse 29 as well as Genesis chapter 49, verse 17, you realize that Dan, because of their idolatry, they have been discounted. However, Dan will still be counted during the millennium, according to Ezekiel chapter 48, verse 1, because of Jacob's blessing upon him, that Dan might still be one of the tribes that are there by the salvation of the Lord. Genesis chapter 49, verses 16 to 18. Now, in addition to the remnant of Israel, there is also another people that God has, the redeemed saints of the church. This is chapter seven, verse nine to 17. So you see that God is showing us here that he will preserve his people, the redeemed saints. He will preserve them throughout all the tribulations. God will preserve them. I know a lot of Christians are afraid of the coming tribulation and the calamities that are coming, but here the Bible is telling us that God will preserve his people. God will preserve the saints. The way God preserves the chosen remnant of Israel is by placing a seal on them. But whilst Israel has a seal on them, you will see that the Christians do not have a seal. God promised Abraham to give him people like the stars of the heavens and like the sands of the seashore, according to Genesis chapter 22, verse 17. The sons that are like the stars of the heavens, those are the heavenly sons or the spiritual sons of Abraham. Those are the Christians. We are the sons of Abraham. We are the spiritual sons of Abraham. We are not his physical descendants. We are his spiritual sons. We are what we're called the ones who are like the stars of the heavens. Those are the heavenly people. Those are the Christians and that is us. We are like the stars. The earthly people who are the Israelites are like the sand of the seashore. So in order to preserve his earthly people, God seals them and keeps them on earth. You will not take them from the earth to the heavens. However, God's way of preserving the redeemed saints is not to keep them on earth, but to take them up away by means of rapture. So the rapture will not only occur once, and it will not just be a one of a kind. It, it will happen several times, as you will see. There will be at least two or three types of raptures, I believe where eventually all the redeemed saints in the church will be raptured from the earth to the heaven. But why this chapter has been put in here is to show us that God will still love his people enough to redeem them from the tribulation, to save and preserve them. So the saints of God will be raptured. So here is the beginning of the sixth seal. When the first overcomers are raptured, or the first fruit are raptured, that's before the sixth seal. Because the sixth seal, remember we said it is the beginning of the supernatural calamities that are executed by God on the earth 
So just before that happens, God will rapture them. So he raptures his redeemed ones. This is why it's very important for us to make sure that we live a life that keeps us close to God. We live a life that is pleasing to God. We live as the redeemed of the Lord, that we may be raptured of the Lord. Now, there will then be a harvest of the majority of the Christians who will have passed through the great tribulation. The ones that are not taken away at this stage will go through the great tribulation. The great tribulation is meant to cause them to repent truly. Because right now, some people are claiming to be Christians when they are fake. They are not genuine. They will have to go through the, the tribulation. Then when people go through all the sufferings and the, all the hardships, they will realize their need for the Lord. Then they will genuinely turn to the Lord. So they must then also come another time when they are also raptured to God. So, verse 9 of chapter 7, after these things, I saw and behold a great multitude which no one could number. The great multitude consists of the redeemed ones through all the generations from every nation, every tribe. They are innumerable. That's why you couldn't put a number to them. This is the church that is raptured. According to Romans chapter 11, 25, Acts chapter 15, verse 14 and verse 19. So the great multitude consists of those who have been purchased by the blood of the Lamb from every nation, tribe, people, and town. Those are the people that make up the church, those that are blood-bought, the saints that are washed by the blood. Then, when he speaks about this great multitude in verse 9, one of the elders says, these are those who come out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Verse 14. So the great tribulation is different from the great tribulation mentioned in Matthew chapter 24, 21. The tribulation here that he's talking about, this is in a general sense. He's talking about the Christians who have gone through trials here on earth. Many of us have gone through tribulations and we're going through tribulations and we'll continue to go through tribulations until this time. But as we go through those tribulations, we continue to call upon the blood of Jesus. We continue to call upon the name of Jesus and we are preserved. And this is what this is referring to. It's referring to the tribulations that you go through as a Christian in life in general, not the tribulation of the wrath of God, no. This is the tribulations that we go through in general in life. When you look at some of the things you have gone through, in your lives. Some of you have gone through difficulties. You have gone through painful things. You have gone through things that have caused you to cry, things that have caused you to weep, things that have caused you to almost want to give up, but you have not given up. You have held on and you have continued in the Lord. That is overcoming the tribulations of life. And the Bible is now speaking about those. And it then says about those, because there's no Christian that can avoid these tribulations, you know, in our spirits, oh, we are people who enjoy life, but in our physical side, hey, we go through stuff, people. That's what happens with Christians. However, even as the suffering ones, there will come a day here, it speaks about them coming triumphantly, holding palms in their hands. Now, palm branches signify victory over tribulation. If you read John chapter 12, verse 13, these are people who have undergone a lot for the Lord's sake. Palm trees are also, a, they signify fulfillment through watering, according to Exodus chapter 15, verse 27. Palm trees are very thirsty trees. They are very good at soaking up water. They need a lot of watering. So here you are seeing these palm trees or the palm branches. They are satisfied by having received a lot of water. Again, the Bible speaks about the word of God being 
the water, the Bible speaks about the watering of the word. And that is what brings satisfaction to Christians. Jesus in John chapter 4 says to the woman at the well, if you knew who you were talking to, you would say to me, give me to drink. I have got water that if you drink, you will never thirst again. You'll be satisfied with this watering. So here these Christians are triumphant because they have been satisfied through the watering of the word of God. This is why we must be people who are sound, not in miracles, but in the word of God. Yes, we must have miracles, but miracles that are not based on the word of God are magic. Today we have a lot of magicians who call themselves prophets. You know, they do things that are not based on the word of God. That is not right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You may not say amen, but <laughs> that is the truth. We must be a people who are sound in the word of God. If you are a prophet, if you are a prophetess, be sound in the word of God. We hear a lot of guys, he stands up and he just goes into miracles. No preaching of the word of God. Right up to the end and people go home. Uh, what, what is the foundation? What is the basis for that? Where, where do they stand on? They go home empty of the word of God. And eventually those miracles are not sustainable because what sustains them is the word of God. I pray that everyone who is on this forum here will be a Christian who is sound in the word of God solid in the word of God. When you are sound in the word of God, you cannot be moved by things. You will not be easily blown away by every wind and doctrine. No, you will be solid and grounded and you'll be satisfied like these palm leaves that are signifying a satisfaction through watering. Amen. Again, when you read in the Old Testament, you have the Feast of the Tabernacles. They would come with these palms, and I think I'm digressing and I'm taking you to scriptures you guys have never read, isn't it? You need to read your Bible, you guys. Read your Old Testament, the Feast of the Tabernacles. <laughs> so now they are standing before the throne of God. So the redeemed ones have been raptured now, and they are in the presence of God. They are standing before the Lamb. I love this. They are standing before the throne of God. Again, according to Luke chapter 21, verse 20, I mean verse 36. So these people have been raptured. They are now standing in the presence of God or before the throne. Now, verse 9, we've seen that they are clothed with white robes, for they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. I mean, in, in, in Amen. So robes, notice it does not say robe, it says robes, which is plural, robes. Robes are garments, robes are a covering. So your covering or your robes, it speaks about your righteous conduct or your behavior in life. What you, how you conduct yourself, how you behave, how you live your life as a Christian. That is the garment that you will wear. Even before the judgment of God, that is the garment that you stand with. And these people here have got garments that are washed in the blood, garments that are white. In other words, their conduct is pure. The, their conduct is clean. Ah, may our conduct always be clean. May our conduct always be pure. Whenever we do anything, may your motives be right. May your motives be pure. May your motives be clean in everything that you do. Because your motives are going to be weighed by God. They will be put on the scales. And when they are put on the scales, may your motives be found to be valuable. Do you know when people put things on the scale, they are trying to see the value of the thing or the weight of the thing. So we will be weighed on the scale. You remember that mene, mene, take care of a same thing. You have been put on a weight or on a scale and you've been found wanting. Whenever we are put on a scale, hey, may we not be found wanting. Do you know, if I call Sister Angeline now and I say to you, hey, do you know what Sister Tendai was saying about you? Hey. Did you hear what Brother Blessing was saying about you? He was saying this and that and that. My motives for telling you that will be put on the scale by the Lord. 
And when my motives are weighed and they are not found to be pure, I'm in trouble. So everything you do in this life, make sure it has pure reasons behind it. Then you wear garments that are white, washed in the blood, and you qualify to be raptured and to be before the throne of the Lord. Then verse 10 says, and they cried with a loud voice saying, salvation to our God who sits upon the throne and to the Lamb. So you can see here, they're praising in a loud voice and they're only mentioning salvation because they are praising the fact that they have been saved. And that's why it's only salvation they're mentioning there. The great multitude that has been saved, they're very grateful for God's salvation. And that is what they are praising here. And verse 15 says, Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. This great multitude has come out of the great tribulation into the heavenly state in the temple of God where they serve him day and night. So here is my thing. If you are struggling to serve God now when you don't have to serve him day and night, how do you think you will make it when you have to serve him day and night in eternity? <laughs> we have to prepare now. Verse 15 also says that he who sits upon the throne spread this tabernacle over them. Oh, I love this, this verse. He spreads his tabernacle over them. In other words, he tabernacles over them. <laughs> I love this. He tabernacles over them. Uh, so these people, they are not only enjoying being in his presence, but he is tabernacle, tabernacling over them. He has spread his tabernacle over them. In other words, he has spread his dwelling over them. So if God's dwelling is now over them and they are under it, it means they are carrying the dwelling of God. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen to me. As Christians, we must be a people that know how to carry the dwelling of God. We must be a people who know how to house the presence of God. We must be a people who know how to carry the weight of his presence. Because here, he's tabernacling over them. In other words, he's, he's over them. They're underneath. They're able to carry what he's placing above them. I don't know if you guys are getting me on this. We must be a people who know how to carry the presence of God. People how, who know how to house his presence. Many times, you know, in meetings, we say we want to call the presence of God now. But we should be a people who move with his presence and in his presence. So when we enter into a meeting, the atmosphere must sense that somebody has come in with the presence of God. Demons began to cry when Jesus walked into a place before he had even said anything. He would walk into the place and the demons would cry out. They would sense that somebody who carries the presence has come in. We must be a people who <laughs> demons would cry out and say, have you come to torment us? When Jesus has not even addressed them, just walking into a place, the presence of God. Paul carried such a presence. He would go into a place and demons would manifest without him having addressed them. He carried the presence where God tabernacles over you. Oh, oh. Hey, 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 hey. Now this thing is taking me where I did not want to go tonight. <sighs> Listen, people. As a Christian, you can go into a meeting you can go into a meeting. The moment you walk into the meeting, the tone of the meeting changes. It does not even have to be just a Christian meeting. Any meeting, you walk in there. Even people who are argumentative and people, they, they are silenced just by you walking in because you are carrying a certain presence. 
I remember there was a sister who was forced to go to, to a witch doctor by her father and their family, they wanted to go. But she says, I'm a Christian, I can't go. It's against what I believe. And the father said, you will go, I'm the father. And the spirit of God said to her, go. They went. The moment they walked into that witch doctor's place, the guy jumped up and said, this one must go back, pointing at the, at the, at the, at the sister. This one must go back. She's messing me up. It caused her father to begin to realize that what her, his daughter carried was far bigger than what this witch doctor carried. That's how her father and her family came to Christ. But all she did was to be there. And what she housed began to show itself. May we be a people who carry the presence of God. May we be a people who know how to house his presence. When you carry the presence of God, listen, when Daniel, when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into the fire, the Bible says Nebuchadnezzar came to check in the fire. Now notice, he had said, heat up the fire seven times. Now, seven times more than the usual time. That means that fire was extremely hot. The people who tried to throw them in were actually burned by the fire. But this king, somehow in his head, he's thinking, there's something about these boys that's telling me they're not dead in that fire. Because if you throw something into the fire and you come to check it, it's because somehow you believe it's not burnt. Because if you throw it in, then you believe it's burnt. You don't need to check it. But the king comes to check because something in him tells him, these boys, they carry a certain presence that tells me that they might still be alive in that fire. <laughs> and then when he comes and he looks into the fire, he sees the fourth man, the presence. Ay, 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 the presence. When people look at you, they must not just see you alone. They must see the presence. They must see the Lord with you. Because he says, his name shall be called Emmanuel. The Lord is with us. You must be a people who whenever people look at you, they see the Lord with you. Where he is tabernacling with you. When Paul and Silas begin to sing, the Bible says thunderings and earthquakes begin to happen. When you're going to the Old Testament, whenever God approached a scene, there would be thunderings and there would be earthquake. Again, here in Revelation, we read when God's presence comes, there are thunderings and earthquakes. So when Paul and Silas are praising, there are thunderings and earthquakes signifying the presence of God. And the doors begin to open, the chains begin to fall because there is no chain that can withstand the presence of God. There is no bondage that can withstand the presence of God. There is no situation that can withstand the presence of God. Whatever situation you are facing, whatever bondage it may be, introduce it to the presence of God and watch everything fall apart. Watch everything begin to go because of the presence. Ah, uh, people, I'm sensing we might end up going somewhere where <laughs> we will not finish the night. Shall we pray? Father, we bless you. We honor you. We give you honor. We give you praise. We give you glory. Hallowed be your holy name. Amen. Teach us to be carriers of your presence. Amen. Teach us how to house your presence. Yes, Lord. Thank you. To carry your presence, my God. To have the heart Thank you. The presence of Elohim. The presence of the mighty. The presence of the Almighty. The presence of Jehovah. The presence. The presence. The presence. The presence. The presence, the presence. Hallelujah. 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 Say, if you do not go with us, we are not going there. We are not going there. Moses said, unless your presence is with us, we are not going there. Yes, Lord. Teach us to house your presence, to be a people who know 
how to house and to carry the very presence of God. In the name of Jesus. Oh, Father, tonight, would you help us? Would you help us? Would you teach us? Would you show us tonight? Father, we thank you for the thunder. Oh, yes, Lord, we thank you, magnify your name. We just want to take us to a place where we can. Father, tonight I want to pray for some that are here tonight on this platform. Thank you, mighty God. I want to pray that tonight they would have an encounter with your presence. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I want to pray that tonight you would open up the heavens over them. Amen. Amen. Yes, Lord. Let your presence come. Even in this the night, my Father, may they experience the presence of God. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. In whatever meetings they may address or meetings they may attend, Thank you, Lord. We yes. thank you. May the presence speak. Yes, May Lord. the presence oh, be evident. Oh, May the presence. May the presence. May the presence. of God. In the name the of the dwelling of God, the dwelling of God, the dwelling Hallelujah. of God be upon them. Thank you, Lord. We are operating God. We are operating God. The tabernacle of God. The tabernacle of God. Tabernacle of God. Tabernacle of God. Hallelujah. Father, we pray, God, that even as your word begins, Lord, to minister to us, Lord. We bless you. Yes, and Father, we thank you. Glorify you. You, you are in the name of Jesus. Yes, Father. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We believe in your glory, Lord. We believe Hallelujah. in your mercy, Lord. We worship we you, Father. Believe your power, your we blood you, is still working, mm. Lord. Hallelujah. Even in our times of despair, yeah. Lord, we pray, God, that we yes. will find hope. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Father. This subject of value, of Lord. Of God. Hallelujah. And your message has been God overemphasized, Lord, in our lives. Thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 One of the things oh, that we the value that, that we, we carry and the value Thank that the Word of God, Lord, carries yes, Lord. in us. But we thank yes, you. Lord. Thank you, you realize Father. that the tabernacle of God Thank you. is something that is eternal. It is eternal, the tabernacle of God. So when God tabernacles over you, you are not housing something that is temporary. You are housing something that is eternal. May the presence of God over your life be not temporary. Amen. Oh, Amen. May it not be temporary. Mm. May the presence of God over your life be eternal. Mm. May it rest upon your life. May you feel the weight or the heaviness of his presence. The heaviness and the weight or the kabod. You know, when you talked about when you talk about the kabod of God. Or the glory of God, you can only describe it in terms of its weight or its heaviness. And so I pray that each and every one of us here tonight may be brought to that place where God spreads his tabernacle over your life. Mm. In other words, you are covered by the tabernacle of his presence. Mm -hmm. Covered by the tabernacle. Amen. Remember that within that tabernacle of God, mm -hmm. there is the Holy of Holies. Wow. There is the mercy Amen. seat. Yes. There is the accommodation of the cherub and the seraphim. Oh my God. May all these be accommodated in your life. Amen. May I receive. Amen. In your life. Amen. May they be accommodated in your life. May the presence and the glory Amen. and the cheerful of God be accommodated in your life as he spread the tabernacle over you. In the name of Jesus. 
The Bible then says in verse 16 and 17, and they shall hunger no more. Oh, yes. Neither shall, they test <laughs> no more. Neither shall the sun beat upon them, nor any heat. Mm. For the lamb in the midst of the throne shall shepherd them. Hallelujah. And guide them to the springs of waters of life. Hey, this book of Revelation. They shall not hunger anymore. Neither shall they thirst. Amen. Because the lamb in the midst shall shepherd them yes. and guide them. This okay. is what David saw in, Psalm in the Lord when he sang Psalm 23. He saw mm -hmm. what John is now seeing in Revelation. Hallelujah. And because the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Mm. And here now the Bible says they shall not want. Mm. Because the Lamb who is in the midst shall shepherd them. Mm. May the Lamb of God shepherd you. Thank you. May He shepherd you. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. God bless you, people of God. Thank we meet you, again man. next Thursday and we will continue with the book of Revelation. May the Lord bless you. Amen. 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 Pastor, I just have a song that's on my heart. If I, yes. I'm sure you guys know it. <laughs> it's actually a, a song I learned from Tembalani Praise. Right. It goes like this. Right. right. Mm. Hallelujah. Amen. So that is calling upon the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 That's exactly how it should be. Hallelujah. Yes. Mm. Indeed. Indeed. Mm. Mm. Because mm. I won't go, no, no, without yeah. you. Yes. I won't go, no, no, mm. without your presence. Amen. 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 Wow. Thank you so much. The Lord bless you guys Amen. and keep you. Have a wonderful week. Amen. The rest of the week until we meet again. Please read the book of Revelation. Don't just wait for Thursday. Yeah. Amen. Thank Amen. you so much, Pastor. Bless you, Pastor. God bless you. you are most welcome, people of God. I love you. May the Lord bless Amen. you. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Bless Thank you. Me. Bless you. Amen. Blessed. No, 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 no,